Ladies and gentlemen. This episode is sponsored by Advanced Skills Company, the official agent of JPI Healthcare in Iraq. I personally use the products of JPI Healthcare in my clinic for years now, and throughout the years, these products have been amazing in terms of providing excellent image quality at the lowest radiation dose possible, and they are durable, reliable, and efficient. I recommend if you are looking to establish your radiology practice, whether in a clinic, in a center, or in a hospital setting, to go to the JPI Healthcare website, see their products for yourself, and then call Advanced Skills Company if you are in Iraq, and these guys will provide the best possible solutions, whether in terms of hardware or software. I will leave the contact information in the video description, and don't forget to use the magic word highlights in radiology, because you will get a 10% discount on all JPI Healthcare products till the end of 2024. Hello everyone and welcome to a new episode of Highlights in Radiology Season 2. In this episode, we are going to talk about a very common cause of shoulder pain, which is subacromial impingement or supraspinatus impingement. Before we start, I want to remind you to like, subscribe, share, and tell your friends about us. This is Dr. Ahmad Zaya Abdul Wahab, and this is Highlights in Radiology Season 2. Stay with me. Subacromial impingement is defined as progressive painful compression of supraspinatus tendon and subacromial bursa between the humeral head and the coracoacromial arch. It is seen most commonly in adults more than 40 years of age, and it tends to be more common in males than females. Most common sign and symptom is an insidious onset of shoulder pain, especially with abduction and forward flexion. There will be pain to palpation of the rotator cuff within the range of extension. Also pain and weakness to supraspinatus testing. It is also seen commonly in younger athletes participating in sports requiring overhead arm movement. The range of motion is painful, but usually it is preserved. Treatment can be either conservative or surgical. Conservative treatment includes physical therapy and steroid injections while surgical treatment includes acromial decompression and acromioplasty. What happens in subacromial impingement is physical compression with repetitive microtrauma. The causes of that is either primary extrinsic or secondary extrinsic causes. Primary extrinsic causes are either from coracoacromial arch, which includes subacromial spur, acromioclavicular joint osteoarthritis, coracoacromial ligament variations in size and thickness, and less commonly calcification or ossification. Other causes include type 3 or hooked acromion. We will talk about that in a minute. Also, lateral down sloping of the anterior acromion. Osacromiali is another cause, which is unfused apophysis of the anterior acromion. Like we see in this proton density coronal image, in which we can see there is a lateral down sloping of the anterior acromion, also known as type 2 or type B. Another example in this coronal proton density MRI, we can see marked thickening of the coracoacromial ligament and moderate tendinosis with thickening of the supraspinatus tendon. While secondary extrinsic causes include impingement associated with glenohumeral instability seen in cases of overhead throwing activities with no osseous abnormality of the coracoacromial continuum, ranges from instability to subluxation resulting in impingement, also anterior instability. Keep in mind that 95% of rotator cuff tears are secondary to chronic impingement beneath the coracoacromial arch. Other associated abnormalities include biceps, tendinosis, and tears. The acromion process has four shapes or four types as seen in sagittal MRI, and these are type 1, which has a flat undersurface, type 2 has curved undersurface, type 3, in which the anterior one-third is hook-like, this type is associated with impingement, and type 4 has a convex undersurface, which is not associated with impingement. In this example, demonstrating type 1 acromion process, which has a flat undersurface, note that the patient has rotator cuff tear and hill sac deformity secondary to trauma. Another example showing type 2 acromion process, which has a curved undersurface and a lower association of rotator cuff tears compared to type 3. 
This is an example of tile three acromion process, which has an anterior hook. This has the highest association with impingement. And in this example, we can see a large enthesophyte at the anterior acromion at the insertion of the caraca acromion ligament. And this is an example of tile four acromion process, which has a complex undersurface, and this tile is not associated with impingement. Another example showing the four types of the acromion process. This is type one, type two, type three, and type four acromion process. Remember, type three has the highest association of impingement. While lateral downsloping of the anterior acromion has two types, as seen on coronal MRI images, which are type A, which shows mild or non-lateral downsloping, and type B, showing moderate to marked lateral downsloping. As we can see in these examples, on the right image we can see a non-lateral downsloping or type A, while on the left side we see lateral downsloping or type B, which has a higher association with impingement syndromes. So what radiology can offer in subacromial impingement or supraspinatus impingement? Regarding plane radiography, we will see a hooked acromion or type 3 acromion, which is associated with increased risk of impingement as we said. Also, subacromial spurs or acromioclavicular joint arthritis, which includes subchondral cysts or spurs. Like we see in this X-ray, we can clearly see the hooked acromion process or the type 3 acromion, which is associated with increased risk of impingement. Another example showing subacromial spur narrowing the subacromial space. And in this X-ray, we can see a large subacromial spur narrowing the subacromial space. Another example showing osteoarthritis of the acromioclavicular joint with joint space narrowing. Spurs and cysts of the acromion joint are also seen. On CT scan, we can see the subacromial spurs with or without acromioclavicular joint sclerosis and hypertrophy. Also cysts and anterior inferior acromial spurs sometimes seen. Coronal and sagittal reconstructions are helpful for the acromial shape assessment, while in CT arthrography we will see contrast entering the rotator cuff tear. Like in this example, we can see the acromial spur, sclerosis of the acromioclavicular joint also seen, and in this CT arthrography we can see the sclerosis of the acromioclavicular joint with contrast entering the rotator cuff tear. On MRI, on T1 weighted imaging, there will be thickening of the tendon of the supraspinatus muscle with intermediate signal intensity, an impingement related to tendinopathy, with or without thick coracochromial ligament, which narrows the subacromial space on sagittal images. Also, hooked acromion on sagittal images is seen with or without hypo-intense greater tuberosity cysts like in this T1-weighted image, showing thickened tendon with intermediate signal intensity and impediment related to tendinopathy with thick coracoacromial ligament which narrows the subacromial space. Another example of T1-weighted image showing thickened tendon with intermediate signal intensity and prominent acromial spur. While on T2-weighted imaging, we will see tendon degeneration as thickened tendon with increased signal intensity. Also, full thickness supraspinatus tears might be seen as a hyperintense fluid-filled gap. While partial tears will be seen as hyperintensity undersurface with hyperintensity bursal surface and hyperintensity in the interstitium with or without hyperintense greater tuberosity cysts and the fluid signal intensity in the bursi, which can involve the subacromial or the subcoracoid bursi with or without thickened coracochromial ligament. Like in this example, we can see tendon degeneration as thickened tendon with increased signal intensity, also partial thickness supraspinatal steer seen as hyperintense fluid filled gap with some hyperintensity in the interstitium. Another example showing tendon degeneration as thickened tendon with increased signal intensity with a small subacromial spur. And another example, we can see thickened coracoacromial ligament causing impingement of the tendon of the supraspinatus muscle. After contrast injection, partial tears may or may not show post-contrast enhancement. Same for full thickness tear, while bursitis will show enhancement of the inflamed synovium. On MR arthrogram, the tendon tears may be filled with contrast. Thickened heterogeneous tendon or torn tendon are seen, also type 3 acromial process as a congenital variant or acquired osteophytes, which predisposes to subacromial impingement. Acromial enthesophyte formation also seen, which appears to be containing bone marrow. 
lateral downsloping predisposes to subacromial impingement as seen in coronal images. Like we see in this MRR nephrography, we can see easily the full thickness tear of the tendon of the supraspinatus muscle. And another example of MRR nephrography, and the tendon is completely torn and filled with contrast. Also, there is lateral downsloping, which predisposes to subacromial impingement. So what's the differential diagnosis in this condition? Well, the list here includes internal impingement, also known as posterior superior glenoid impingement or PSGI, acute trauma, os acromiali, suprascapular denervation, adhesive capsulitis, subcoracoid impingement, and hidden lesions. Regarding internal impingement, it is seen in throwing athletes, so it's occupational in nature. We will have a triad of findings, which includes posterior superior humeral head impaction injury, posterior superior labral fraying or frag tearing, and posterior superior rotator cuff partial tearing. There will be impingement inside the shoulder joint. Abduction with external rotation MR nephrography is used for the detection of partial undersurface tears. Like we see in this example, we can see posterior superior humeral head impaction injury and posterior superior rotator cuff partial tear. Another example, we can see the posterior superior impingement on coronal T1 weighted MR arthrogram with fat suppression and transverse T1 weighted MR arthrogram. They show partial tear in the supraspinatus tendon as well as degeneration and fraying of the posterior superior glenoid labrum. In acute trauma, there will be rotator cuff tear on acute traumatic basis, with or without the existing impingement and or fractures of the humerus, glenoid, or both. We will see hyperintense edema or hemorrhage on T2-weighted imaging. Like in this example, which show avulsion injury with subscapularis tendon tear with tendon retraction following acute trauma. Another example showing minor tendinous junction rupture of the supraspinatus muscle following trauma. In osochromiali, we will see degenerative changes that may lead to pain with abduction. It is a failure of fusion of the normal ossification. The preacromion, which is the most distal type of osochromiali, is excised, while others are surgically fused with or without rotator cuff tear. Like we see in this X-ray, we can see the preacromion or osochromiali as an unfused apophysis or ossicle. Another example in this MRI, we can see the preacromion or the osacromiali unfused due to failure of complete effusion. Suprascapular denervation can mimic impingement clinically. There will be weakness and pain of the supraspinatus and infraspinatus. Denervation hyperintense muscles are seen on T2 weighted images, on stair images, proton density fat saturated images, with or without paralabral cysts, which causes compression in neuropathy. Like we see in this example, we can see edema involving the supra and infraspinatus muscles due to denervation. Another example here, we can see marked edema involving the supra and infraspinatus muscles due to denervation. The next differential diagnosis is adhesive capsulitis, which causes limitation in both active and passive range of motion. While in impingement, there is usually no limitation in the passive range of motion. So we will see thickened hyperintense capsule on coronal images, also axillary pouch of the inferior humeral ligament or the IGHL is seen at the rotator interval. Frozen shoulder with or without rotator cuff tear is also seen. Like we see in this example, there is thickened hyperintense capsule on coronal imaging, thickening of the inferior glenohumeral ligament is seen with some edema of the supraspinatus tendon. Another example showing thick hyperintense capsule on coronal images with thickening of the inferior glenohumeral ligament or the IGHL also seen, and some edema of the supraspinatus tendon is also seen. In subcoracoid impingement, we may or may not see subscapularis tendon tear or hyperintense lesser tuberosity cyst. There will be pain with internal rotation with or without hidden lesions. Like in this example of subcoracoid impingement, we can see hyperintensity in the lesser tuberosity. Another example showing subscapularis tendon tear has marked edema and thickening of the tendon. The last differential diagnosis is hidden lesions, in which there will be biceps tendon instability, superior glenohumeral ligament, and coracohumeral ligament abnormality with or without subscapularis tear.
Like in this example, we can see the coracochromial ligament tear with subscapular tear. Another example showing the biceps tendon dislocation and coracohumeral ligament tear. Well, this was all for today's episode. At the end, don't forget to subscribe, like, share, and tell your friends about us. If you have any comments, write them in the comment section. See you next Friday at 5 p.m. This is Dr. Ahmadiyya Abdurrahad, and this is Highlights in Radiology Season 2. Bye.